Dr. Sharon Moe. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, the School of Medicine there. And I'm here to talk about kidney, heart, and bone and the crosstalk between them. These are my disclosures and the outline of the presentation. The coronary atherosclerotic calcification is assessed on CT methods where we color code the arteries that have the same density as bone. The calcification pathologically occurs early on in the plaque during the inflammation, and as it progresses and the plaque gets larger, the calcification contributes to the vulnerability and rupture leading to thrombus and obstruction. Calcification can also occur in the medial layer. As shown on these slides, this is the inferior epigastric artery where we see calcification in the medial layer on the left in black, and on the right we can see it's almost circumferentially damaged this entire vessel. There's a little bit of entomal changes on the right artery, but nothing on the left. So medial calcification can occur independent of entomal changes. Using coronary artery calcification scans, on the right is men, on the left is women, there is increasing calcification normally with aging. But the higher the calcification at every age, shown here in the blue, is the highest, the decreased survival of the patient. So higher coronary calcification score, can occur with aging, but the higher it is, the more likely the patient is to die. We also know that normally with advanced aging, you lose bone mass over time. And in fact, for every age, there is a dramatic rise as over the age of 50 in terms of bone loss. So in longitudinal studies, when aortic calcification is measured at the same time as the hip bone mineral density and generally healthy postmenopausal women followed for seven and a half years, the greater the increase in aortic calcification, the greater the decrease in the hip bone mineral density. It's not just calcification, it's actually general atherosclerosis. So in this meta-analysis, in both male and female patients and in postmenopausal women, a low bone mineral density compared to a normal bone mineral density, there is increased calcification, sorry, increased atherosclerosis in the patients who have the lower bone mineral density. And even when this is adjusted for age, sex, BMI, and other vascular risk factors, the presence of a low versus normal bone mineral density is associated with a threefold increase in atherosclerosis. So this study, published recently by a group in Denmark, took advantage of a unique design. They took 5-6 nephrectomy um, animals, rats, and they induced kidney disease, fed them with a high phosphorus diet, lots of vitamin D, and the result was chronic kidney disease animals with intensive aortic vascu vascular calcification. They then took the calcified aortas and they transplanted them into normal rats, and they took normal aortas from other animals and transplanted them into normal rats. The result was that the animals who received the calcified aorta had a lower bone mineral density than the animals who received the normal aorta. They then took those arteries, they put them in a petri dish, and measured the media level of a substance called sclerostin, and only the calcified aortas secreted sclerostin. Well, what is sclerostin? Well, it's actually a bone protein made by osteocytes, and these osteocytes are cells that are mechanosensors in the bone. When sclerostin is increased, it inhibits osteoblastic bone differentiation and inhibits bone formation. Sclerostin also stimulates osteoclast bone resorption through rank ligand. So the result of in decreased bone formation and increased uh, bone resorption is, of course, low bone mass. So how do these processes work? Well, there are many types of formation of bone. Um, one is called endochondral, and this is how the long bones form, where we have cartilage cells that go from a resting state to proliferation and hypertrophy. Those cells then lay down mineral and matrix and become calcified. The signaling for these resting to proliferative to hypertrophied chondrocytes is in part through Wnt signaling, which is stimulated by sclerostin, and also through upregulation of a transcription factor called RUNCS2. Intramembranous bone formation, which occurs in the skull, the cells start from the mesenchymal cells and they differentiate into osteoblasts, lay down an unmineralized bone called osteoid. Then some of these cells become the osteocytes with that canalicular network, and then blood vessels infiltrate this. Once the blood vessels have infiltrated, then circulating monocytes can come to that bone, they're homed to go there, they fuse to form osteoclasts. 
Once you have long bone or intramembranous bone that is formed, over lifespan it's remodeled. Only a small part of your bones are remodeled at any one time. And the signal from that is given from the osteocytes that tell these circulating monocytes to come to a certain part of bone, fuse, and become osteoclasts. These then resorb away the bone, leaving behind pits. The thin lining osteoblast cells differentiate, fill in this pit with osteoid, and then it's subsequently mineralized. Now there's a lot of regulation and crosstalk between the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts. But again, the osteocytes make sclerostin, SOST is the gene name, stimulate the osteoclasts. The osteoclasts then stimulate the osteoblasts, and sclerostin also knocks down the osteoblast transcription factors in order to decrease bone formation. So there's a crosstalk signaling that happens. Now, what happens in the arteries then? So how do arteries become bone-like? Well, this is actually the same type of vessels that I showed you earlier. In this particular patient, who had CKD and diabetes, had medial calcification and an intimal plaque. The calcification is shown here in black in both layers of the artery. And by in situ hybridization, we see the, the purple dots here represent upregulation of the transcription factor RUNX2. And if you knock out RUNX2 from a mouse model, that model, that animal will not form any normal bone. So what is it that actually makes these vessels turn into little bones? Well, vascular smooth muscle cells normally sit in our bodies in a kind of contractile quiescent stage through upregulation of myocardin. Then various st uh, stimuli increase the intracellular calcium and switch this cell from a contractile to a proliferative vascular smooth muscle cell where myocardin is downregulated. Once the cells are in that state, they can further dedifferentiate, upregulate RUNX2, and turn into little osteochondrocytic like vascular smooth muscle cells. And the cells do what bone cells do. They make mineral. So the factors that can lead to this switch, this vascular phenotypic change in vivo to a synthetic state, include all of the traditional cardiac risk factors, many of them mediated through angiotensin II, which increases intracellular calcium. Furthermore, all of the non-traditional risk factors, inflammation, oxidation, AGEs, and in CKD, hyperphosphatemia, upregulate RUNCs2, at least in vitro, and change these vascular smooth muscle cells to osteochondrocytic-like cells. The result is vascular calcification, but a third step has to happen first, and that is either an abnormal mineral me metabolism and or reduced calcification inhibitors. So when calcium and phosphorus are put together, they start to form a mineral deposit. And the more calcium and phosphorus added, the more these grow. This is purely physical chemical and does not need anything else to happen except the pH changes. So in, we would all be calcified all over if we didn't have inhibitors located in various body parts that prevent this spontaneous calcification. So the procalcifying factors are this dedifferentiation that I mentioned, and also excess calcium and phosphorus. The inhibitors of calcification are both circulating and locally expressed. So if you take a vascular smooth muscle cell and you put it in a Petri dish, it will become that, that uh, differentiated vascular smooth muscle cell. And then if you add normal phosphorus and high calcium to the media, you'll get mineralization. If you order, if you add high phosphorus and normal calcium, you'll also get mineralization. And if you add both high phosphorus and high calcium, you'll get even more mineralization. How does that occur? Well, in bone, the hypertrophic chondrocytes and osteoblasts secrete vesicles that are filled with calcium and phosphorus. When these vesicles land on a matrix of collagen and other uh, proteins, they can rupture and release the calcium and phosphorus that is inside of those vesicles. In unmineralized bone in the section of osteoid shown here, you see lots and lots of little matrix vesicles. Some of them have already ruptured and are beginning to lay down calcium phosphorus in the form of hydroxyapatite. Now, arterial calcification also occurs via vesicles. So these are cultured vascular smooth muscle cells where we add these matrix vesicles. And you can see they attach and adhere to the collagen where they will then rupture and deposit mineral. Well, Dr. Hutchison has done beautiful work in atherosclerotic plaque showing the same kind of principle, where these vesicles conglomerate, shown here in orange, in areas of collagen shown in green. 
He's been able to replicate that in collagen hydrogels and shown that this actually forms hydroxyapatite. But not all vesicles are created equal. And in fact, the, whatever the cell is, they can secrete many types of vesicles. So exosomes are classically thought of as vesicles that are put out, and they can be received by a recipient cell and transfer information. Ma uh, multivesicular bodies are also present inside cells, and microvesicles can be uh, exocytosed as well. And even when a cell it undergoes apoptosis, it may create a little nidus on which calcium and phosphorus can form. And all of these types of vesicles have been identified in areas of vascular calcification, but they differ in what's inside of them and what regulates the mineralization. So for example, we have done studies on normal vascular smooth muscle cells from rats and found that they will endocytose matrix vesicles that we obtained from vascular smooth muscle cells that are calcifying. When they are endocytose, the recipient cell uh, has reactive oxygen species increase, increase intracellular calcium, and induces calcification. But when we take the vesicles out of the media layer, um, not from the cells themselves, they don't mineralize in the recipient cells. Why is that? Well, probably because those vesicles in the media contain fetuin, an inhibitor. What are these inhibitors? Well, in bone, uh, the calcium enters matrix vesicles through the annexins. The phosphorus increases through sodium phosphate co-transporters. And inside the cells, the calcium and phosphorus will combine together and grow and grow. This is actually inhibited through the insertion of an inhibitor called pyrophosphate that goes into the cell through an ANK receptor. Um, and this whole process from ATP to PPI to monophosphate ion is regulated by enzymes called TNAP and ENPP. And we know that genetic defects in these various uh, parts of that process can lead to arterial and periarticular mineralization, changes in joints and tissues, and skeletal hypomineralization, proving that these inhibitors are very important in bone mineralization. Well, what about vascular calcification? Well, there's at least 20, if not more, mice models demonstrating that when you knock out a specific gene or a transcription factor, that you get vascular calcification in different vascular beds. Fetuin A is a serum inhibitor of mineralization. Matrix glyoprotein is probably the most important to prevent arterial calcification. But there's also pyrophosphate, which is locally synthesized and can lead to soft tissue calcification. And bisphosphonate drugs are actually an analog of pyrophosphate. So what is Fetuin A? Well, it is a reverse acute phase reactant. So during inflammation, the levels are low. And what you see in the knockout animals is diffuse soft tissue calcification all across and all in the organs, including the myocardium and the kidney. And this is in the form of hydroxyapatite. So in the presence of CKD, you have a double whammy. You have inflammation, which knocks down the Fetuin A, and you have increased calcium and phosphorus. So the Fetuin A like, acts like a vacuum cleaner and goes through the blood and grabs these initiators of mineralization, calcium and phosphorus particles, and gets rid of them through the reticuloendothelial system. Another inhibitor is matrix glyoprotein. And the knockout mice for these animals develop diffuse arterial calcification, shown in red here with the lizard and staining. And also, you can see on higher magnification, black along the elastin fibers representing calcification. So matrix glyoprotein is important because it requires gamma carboxylation in order to become an active inhibitor. This gamma carboxylation step is mediated by vitamin K. And one of these enzymes is actually inhibited by warfarin or Coumadin. And in patients on dialysis, they get calciphylaxis, which is an arterial calcification in the skin that leads to skin breakdown. About 50% of those patients are reported to have been on Coumadin. So this makes sense that maybe there's a treatment here. We could just give patients more vitamin K. And in fact, there are three randomized trials that do show reduced vascular calcification by meta-analysis with vitamin K administration. Uh, many studies are ongoing, so we should have a good answer about whether or not this is a true treatment in the next couple of years. In addition, if we can just prevent those crystal conglomerates from increasing in size, we might be able to help slow down any progression of calcification. And this is a novel drug by Sanofit that is um, given intravenously, and it prevents the growth of the hydroxyapatite crystals. In patients on dialysis studied for a year, 
compared to placebo, the administration of the drug IV thrice weekly reduced the progression of coronary artery calcification by volume and Agatston methods. Importantly, you see even a, a greater decrease in cardiac valve, aortic valve calcification scores over the course of the year with the treatment. So these offer hope for some preventive treatments or some inhibitors down the road. So in summary, there are three classes of calcification of the arteries. So the first is inflammatory, which is seen in atherosclerotic disease in the entoma. The second is metabolic, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and sometimes in aging. It's in the medial layer. The genetic disorders, which I've only been able to briefly touch on, also occur mostly in the media. In all three situations, it's a combination of a loss of inhibitors and a gain of an activator to cause the calcification. There are many lo local activities and circulating factors that can contribute to this calcification. And the end result is actually vascular stiffness and plaque vulnerability in the atherosclerotic lesion. Metabolic abnormalities um, have vascular stiffness or thickened aorta and increased pulse pressure. Well, what do these do exactly? Well, here's an example of a patient on dialysis undergoing a cardiac angiogram. On fluoroscopy, where there's no dye yet, you shouldn't be able to see the arteries. And what you have is an actual visualization of the artery because it's calcified along the edge. And in fact, what you see when you shoot dye through is a large blood clot. But what should happen with the thrombus is that you get vasoconstriction of the distal vessel to preserve, preserve perfusion of the myocardium. But you can't in this vessel because basically the valve is stuck open, the, the heart is stuck open, and these vessels are stuck open. And what happens then is when that patient undergoes dialysis and the blood pressure drops, there's no helping that myocardium because that vessel is stuck in the open position. In arteriosclerosis, normally what happens when you, uh, your heart beats and you have systole and it goes down, exchanges blood at the capillary, it comes back perfectly timed with diastole in the heart where you can actually perfuse the coronary arteries. But in calcified arteries or elderly stiff arteries where there's an increased pulse wave velocity, you'll see that the blood returns too rapidly and there's a mismatch of blood flow at the heart. This increases the vascular afterload, giving you LVH, it decreases the coronary perfusion pressure, it increases myocardial oxygen demand and subendocardial ischemia, the non stemmies and it increases endothelial dysfunction. So that's the title of the talk was Kidney, Heart, and Bone, Does the Crosstalk Help or Hinder? Well, I think it clearly hinders both bone and um, arterial calcification. But rather than a cause effect back and forth, I think it's an example of cellular plasticity in both organs and a failure of normal inhibitory processes. If you want to learn more, this is a recent book I wrote one chapter for that actually delves into a lot more detail on this topic. It's available online. But thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.